Salud for 2023 and for taking care of our mental health. Hello, beautiful amigos, how's it going? Today is a different video, very different than I have ever made before. I do talk about general mental health in terms of feeling like I'm in a rut, feeling like I'm feeling bled, or I feel a little anxious here and there, but I've never fully talked about anxiety and what it's been like for me. And with the loss of Twitch, his name was Steven Boss, he was an incredible performer, dancer, uh, entrepreneur, uh, father, husband, friend. His death sparked, of course, a big conversation when it comes to mental health, and I feel like this becomes a pattern. We lose someone that everyone never expected to lose in the way of suicide. We have these conversations about mental health, and people are like, oh my god, it's so important to talk about it, and we talk about it maybe for a week or two, and then it dies down again. Of course, we have gone a long, long way when it comes to talking about mental health in the public space. Now there's podcasts about mental health. There are more interviews with famous people about how they struggle with their mental health. I think more YouTubers are talking about mental health and there's more movies about mental health, but I still feel like in the private space, so when I, when I say private space, I mean between you and your friends, between you and your family, have we really done that good of a job to talk about it more and be more transparent? Of course, it's very different for different people. Some families are more open and honest about talking about how they feel. Other families are like, mm, we don't talk about that in this family. We don't talk about this at this dinner table. As we've seen it become more and more of a topic in the public space. I just feel like we could bring that back into our smaller inner circles. And I feel like this is because of a lot of reasons. You know, I I definitely have been in the place where I haven't been doing great mentally because of my anxiety. And you don't wanna feel like a burden. You don't wanna feel like you're that friend who has mental health problems. The people who are receiving the news that you're not doing well could do a better job to really change the way that they look at friends and people who have mental illness. It's very easy for people to start to assume and say, oh, you know what, maybe we shouldn't invite them because they're going through a hard time. And then obviously you not being invited to whatever that is makes you feel worse because then you start to feel like you are that friend with mental illness. So I think it goes both ways, us being more honest about how we're feeling and then people who are receiving the news of people that aren't doing well, especially friends and family, knowing how to welcome and make those people feel like they're not a burden. But I still think that it's important to start the conversations small. Let's talk about it. I'm already sweating, so I'm gonna take off my socks. Woo! This hot coffee, talking about something I've never talked about before. I'm sweating. Let's start when I was very, very young, when I was like 10 to 13 years old, I had my first panic attack that I can specifically remember. I remember I was sitting on my mom's bed, I was watching a show, I don't remember what it was, it might have been a telenovela, like a soap opera honestly, because I used to enjoy that when I was little, okay? But anyway, so I was sitting on my mom's bed and I was watching something and I just remember having this overwhelming sense of doom. That's the only way that I can describe it. I literally felt like the Walls were closing in, like they were caving in. I felt like I could not catch my breath. The very first time you have a panic attack, I've heard from so many people that they honestly feel like they're gonna die. I wasn't in control of my emotions in that moment in time. So I remember just starting to cry. And I think my sister, I'm pretty sure my sister was in the room with me and she just looks over at me and she's like, what? At 13 years old, your very first panic attack. Most of the time, you don't really know how to calm yourself down and you don't know that you're having a panic attack at the time. So I literally thought I was dying. After that, I remember just feeling like a very low simmering level of anxiety, but a level of anxiety that was still a little bit higher than I had ever experienced before. So I remember just constantly feeling like I was on edge. A lot of things startled me, like loud noises startle me. Even just like when someone touches me on the shoulder and I don't see them do it, that can startle me. I'm just very sensitive in this moment in time. And then high school. The summer of my junior year going into my senior year, one of my good friends, 
he passed away. This was the first time that I had really experienced grief in losing someone. And for some reason, that grief triggered the most intense anxiety of my entire life. I feel like I was in fight or flight for two months straight, which then again, I didn't, I didn't understand why I was reacting to losing someone with anxiety. I always thought if you lose someone, then you're sad, which now I realize that grief is something that is very unique to each person. People experience grief in very many different ways. So if you react in a way that is surprising to you, don't be hard on yourself because it's like your body has had such a shock. It's just doing the best that it can in the moment. It was the first time that I was so close to death in my life and I and I realized that wow people can be here one day and then the next day they can be gone and I think it scared me so much that I was just constantly afraid that I was gonna die I couldn't sleep very well I would wake up and my heart would be racing before I could even like fully be awake which was so crazy to me that my body was reacting in a way before I could even open my eyes. I was having a panic attack going anywhere. I remember at this time I developed a sort of agoraphobia, which is essentially your fear of leaving your house, your fear of something going wrong if you leave your comfort zone. So I was just so scared to leave my house. It was the first time where I really realized I am not okay. I really thought I was gonna feel like that forever. Am I just gonna always wake up in a panic? Am I always gonna go to sleep in a panic? Am I never gonna be able to do anything fun anymore? Am I gonna lose all my friends? Okay, let's fast forward a little bit to college. College wasn't too bad until, again, my junior year. There is something about junior year of high school junior year of college. My junior year of college is where it might have gotten the worst that it had ever been in my entire life. At the time, I was dealing with very toxic friendships, and it's really hard to pinpoint the exact day or the exact moment where my anxiety got really, really bad again. It's almost like it gradually happens. I mean, some people might have like a specific event that happened like, oh my God, I fell down the stairs and I hit my head and then all of a sudden like everything was horrible. It's not always that way and I think that I think that's why it's difficult for a lot of people when it comes to explaining how they feel so I think for me it was a culmination of things so I was very stressed I was pre-med I was double majoring I was going crazy with that I had toxic friendships in my life at the time trying to learn how to be away from home which sounds crazy because by the junior by your junior year you feel like you should already know what it's like to be away from home going home for the summer and then going back to school and then all of a sudden you're responsible for everything for yourself. It was very difficult for me. So let me just tell you a little bit about what I was experiencing. It was still very similar to what I had experienced in high school, so loss of appetite. I could not eat breakfast, lunch, or dinner without feeling like I wanted to I would wake up in a panic. I think that was one of the worst things for me is waking up panicking. That's horrible because it's like before you even start your day, you're already literally having an anxiety attack. I remember having panic attacks in class. I would force myself to go to class and I would sit there and automatically I would feel all of the sensations with a panic attack. My hands were sweaty. I could not catch my breath. I felt enclosed. I felt like I needed to escape, like I needed to run back to my dorm or run back to my apartment and just shut myself in my room. What was even more difficult was saying no to people to go out and do fun things because I was so anxious and feeling like I had to lie about it. I think that's one of the hardest things about mental illness is when people invite you to do things and you know deep down inside you would love to do it. You know that it would be so much fun to hang out with that person. You know it would be good for you to hang out with that person, but you just physically, it's like you physically cannot get yourself to do it. And for me, it was the fear of panicking while I was out with my friends. I just automatically assumed the minute I step out of my apartment, I'm going to have a panic attack. I'm not safe anymore. I'm away from my comfort zone. I'm away from my house, my home where I feel safe, kind of, even though I was still panicking in my apartment. I just felt embarrassed. I felt like, oh my God, what am I gonna do if I'm out with my friends and we're at a bar and I have a panic attack and I tell them I need to leave? What are they gonna think? Are they gonna think I'm crazy? Are they gonna be like, what the heck is wrong with her? 
her? Like, why is she freaking out? We're just at a bar. You feel like you need to lie about it because you don't have the energy and you don't want people to question why you are feeling that way. It becomes all you think about and it became all I ever thought about. And often with anxiety, people experience depression. Can I tell you, having anxiety and having symptoms of depression at the same time is just the most conflicting experience that you can ever have. I mean, just think about it. Anxiety means that you're constantly in fight or flight, your mind is racing, and then depression is the complete opposite sometimes. You can't get out of bed, you don't have energy, you don't have energy to shower, you don't have energy to go eat. So having both is not having the energy to get up, and when you do get up, you just feel like you can't calm down. <laughs> People often have both because you know, it's not for everyone, but at least for me, my anxiety got to a point where I was just depressed about it. I was depressed about how bad my mental health had gotten. This was the first time I ever went to get help. I went to the campus counseling office. I personally did not find it helpful. The second step is that I went to the doctor. Do I recommend this? I don't know. The issue is that, that I have seen is that a lot of the time, you know, just family doctors, primary care physicians, PCPs, they like to put a band-aid on it. The first thing that they will say is like, okay, you're feeling anxious, you're having a panic attack, here is an SSRI, here is an antidepressant anxiety medication. In my case, I definitely think medication, and I will talk about it in a second, I think medication was extremely helpful, and to a certain point when you get to such a deep, dark place where you just can't, where therapy is almost, it's gonna go in one ear and it's gonna go out the other ear. Like, it's not gonna be helpful when someone is in such a state where they have dug such a deep hole, they need something more to get themselves out of it. I was terrified when my PCP gave me an anxiety medication, she gave me an SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which basically just provides more serotonin to your brain, which inherently should make you feel better. It does not work for everyone. But I remember the first time she gave me my medication and I felt devastated. I felt like I had failed. I felt like I was crazy. I felt like I am one of those people that needs a medication for my mental health. I didn't know a single person who was taking medication for their mental health. I felt like I'm broken. And that was the other thought that came in my head. I was like, oh my God, what if this doesn't even work? Then what? There was just one day, I think I took half the pill and I did it, nothing happened. And I was like, okay, I need to trust the process. It helped me tremendously. A lot of people who take SSRIs, they sometimes expect it to work immediately. They're like, okay, I've taken the magic pill. I'm gonna feel better. It doesn't happen that way. Obviously, I am not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a counselor. So this is not medical advice, of course. This is just from my own personal experiences, but a lot of the time it can take weeks for you to start to feel the effects. And then sometimes you just wake up one morning and you're just going about your day and you're like, oh my God, the medication is working. Like I feel like a normal human being. I'm not panicking, I'm not depressed. And I think that's where medication is really, really useful. Medication sometimes is what you need in order for you to get from down here to get back to just a baseline where you can function well enough to do the things that are going to help you. So this includes exercise, this includes eating healthy, this includes hanging out with your friends. I think the really scary thing about, about mental illness is that especially if you are experiencing something like anxiety or depression or OCD, whatever it may be for a really long time, it almost becomes your comfort zone. You get so used to being so anxious all the time. You can get so used to being so depressed all the time to the point that when you don't feel that way, you feel like something is wrong. And I noticed this was a trend when I started to heal, when I started to get better and get treatment and feel better. The moments where I did feel normal and I caught myself like not feeling anxious, I felt like something was off. I was like, wait, I'm not anxious. Like I'm always anxious. Like this is weird. I would even get to the point where I just would convince myself that anxiety was who I was and I would bring it on to myself. I would think about the fact that I'm not anxious so much to the point that I would convince myself that I should be feeling anxious and then I would feel anxious. It's so crazy how you can get so used to this blanket 
of mental illness, this blanket of anxiety, of depression. I know it happens to people with addiction. And then after medication, I went to my very first real outside of college therapist and I never turned back. Honestly, that first therapist I had in college, she was the best. There's just something about having an unbiased opinion someone who doesn't know your past doesn't know you like the back of their hand they can tell you honestly why you're thinking the way that you're thinking that being said i want to wrap up the video even though i still have a lot to talk about what are some of the best things that i have learned about managing anxiety over the years the first thing that blew my mind and i still tell people to this day when they are dealing with higher levels of anxiety is that your goal with anxiety should not be to get rid of your anxiety it should be to manage your anxiety anxiety is actually a very very important human emotion when there is an active threat to you in your life then your fight or flight kicks in for a reason let's say you see a snake and then your first instinct is going to be to run to the other direction because your fight or flight has kicked in. Anxiety is why you are on time to your meetings. The anxiety is why you have that pressure and you feel the need to do really well on your exams and to do really well at work. It's that low level of optimal anxiety that keeps us doing well and striving for our goals. But it's when the anxiety presents itself and it's not useful. So for example, anxiety when you're writing an email, it's not really that useful. When you're on a train and the train, there's nothing going on in the train and the train is working very properly and and everything is fine and your anxiety kicks in for no reason, your anxiety is not being helpful to you in that moment in time. So it's identifying when your anxiety pops up and when it's not useful. You need to manage your anxiety for those moments in time. Number two, which is also something that blew my mind when I learned about it in therapy, is you should not ignore your anxiety. Now, everyone always says fear feeds fear, right? Fire feeds fire. Is that the don't fight fire with fire. That's that's what it is. If you convince yourself, like I did in the past, that your anxiety is something that you should fear, you're gonna start to feel like, oh my God, I feel anxious, I need to get rid of it, I need to ignore it, I need to distract myself, I need to talk to a friend. Oh, don't think like that, think positive thoughts, think positive thoughts. Like everyone likes to tell us to think positive thoughts. You're convincing yourself, you're telling yourself and teaching yourself that your anxiety is something that you should be afraid of when it's not. And then you end up with something beautiful that is called anxiety of anxiety. So what's the opposite of distracting yourself from your anxiety? Realizing that you're feeling anxious and accepting that you're feeling anxious. It's looking at anxiety in the face and saying, I see you, I hear you, I know you're here and I'm not afraid of you. How do you actually do that? How do you acknowledge your anxiety? There is a couple of ways that you can do this. You can write it down. So if you're at home and you're starting to feel anxious, you can pull out your journal, you can write down exactly how you're feeling. You can say, my heart rate is up, up, my hands are sweaty I feel like I can't catch my breath if you're out in public you can write in your notes app and say the same thing I'm feeling anxious write down how you're feeling write down what you're thinking write down if you're afraid of something specific or if you're really like in a situation where you can't pull out your phone you can't call someone you can't write in your journal you can just think to yourself you know what yes I am feeling anxious right now my hands are sweaty I feel like I can't catch my breath and just acknowledge it and label it in your head so here's the difference after you've acknowledged it don't engage in it I feel like anxiety builds when we engage in it we start to think oh my god my palms are sweaty I'm gonna start to panic I'm gonna start to panic acknowledging your anxiety is just saying oh yeah I'm anxious right now that's fine but once you start to engage in your anxiety, that's when your anxiety starts to build to the point of a full-blown panic attack. The next thing that you do after you have acknowledged your anxiety is just sit with your anxiety. I know this is so hard to do, especially when you're feeling like, I'm going to have a full-blown panic attack right now. But let's say you're at dinner with your friends and you start to feel anxious. In your mind, you think, okay, I'm feeling anxious, that's okay. But you're gonna stay at the table and you're just gonna imagine that your anxiety is a cloud and just watch it float away. It's almost like you're getting to know your anxiety. And when you get to know your anxiety, it's not a whole strange sensation anymore. The next thing I recommend is to develop an anxiety toolkit. Methods or techniques that you can pull out whenever you're feeling anxious. The first one that I like to do is a quick check-in. Just check in with yourself because sometimes we feel anxious if our basic needs have not been met. Just think, okay, am I hungry right now? 
Have I eaten a full breakfast today? Am I thirsty? Did I get a good night's sleep last night? It helps you just remove that base level of anxiety that is brought upon you just because you didn't eat that day. You can also ask yourself, am I going through something difficult that I didn't realize was really affecting me? Am I going through a breakup? Am I feeling guilty for something? Am I feeling apprehensive about an upcoming test? It just helps you identify what it may be that is triggering your anxiety. The next one is the one that we always hear whenever we go or talk to anyone about anxiety is deep breathing. Now, I actually used to think deep breathing was the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Sometimes I felt like it would make me feel worse in a way. I, especially when I couldn't catch my breath and I was feeling so, so, so incredibly anxious and panicky, it was very hard for me to do the basic like breathe in for seven and then hold your breath for four seconds and then breathe out for nine seconds. Like I found it very difficult to do that. I didn't realize that you can literally modify a breathing technique for you. I don't like to breathe in for so long and hold my breath for so long and breathe out for so long. It honestly makes me feel worse. What I did was modify it in a way that was more helpful for me. So what I do now is I breathe in for four seconds. I hold it for two seconds and then I breathe out for five or six seconds. The only thing you want to keep in mind is that your exhale should always be longer than your inhale. And while you do this, it's really important to try your best to not think about other things. Pay attention to your breathing. So the way that I do this is I like to kind of like follow the path of my breath. If I'm breathing in through my nose, then I notice, I'll pay attention to my nose. I'll notice like how the air is going into my nose and then I'll hold my breath for the two seconds and then as I breathe out, I start to shift my awareness to my mouth and imagine the air really leaving my body. And I just continue to do this and I just follow the path of my breath. And the next one is mindfulness. I actually learned this through Headspace, which is an incredible app that is a great introduction for meditation. I highly recommend it. I am not a full like meditation guru now, but I at least know the basics thanks to Headspace. There's different ways that you can practice mindfulness. Now, the first one is if you're like out in public, if you're out and about, which is where anxiety can often strike. Just think, let's say you're in class or something and you start to feel anxious. You can start practicing mindfulness by noticing things that you can feel. So just start to notice the feeling of your butt on your chair. Notice the feeling of your shoes on your feet. Then you can start to notice what you can hear. So maybe you can hear the person next to you writing down their notes. You just notice the little things that are out side of your body. Now, if you're somewhere where you're by yourself, you're at home, for example, what I like to do is I like to sit down on my bed or I sit down on my couch or any comfy place and I'll do what I call a full body scan. I also learned this from Headspace. You close your eyes, and you start at the top of your head and just imagine you're, there's a scanner and it's scanning your entire body and it starts from your head, it goes all the way down to your toes and let's say you start at your head and you start to notice, okay, how does my head feel? Do I feel my, is my hair really heavy today? Do I feel tension? Do I feel tension in my eyes? And then you move down to your mouth. Do I taste the food from my lunch, etc. You just move down all the way down to your feet and what this does, it again makes you more mindful of not only your body but also what's around your body and what you can feel but it also just removes your attention from your anxiety which we tend to like I said engage in it a lot to other things which is where you can start to calm down and the last one is more of like a physical quick fix I like to say so this is really calming down your nervous system cold water cold temperatures just anything cold really helps us relax our nervous system that's why you see so many people do these cold plunges I'm like I could I don't think I could ever do that something that you can do that's not as crazy as jumping into a lake you can go take a cold shower if you have ice in your fridge you can just like hold two cubes of ice in each hand feel it melting in your hands this is really good if you feel anxious on a plane just ask for a cup of ice. You can put something really cool like an ice pack on your chest or even like a bag of peas. Just put it on your chest. It really helps calm you down. If you're at home and you have your bed, you can put your legs on the wall. Like the legs on the wall technique is amazing when I'm having a full blown panic attack and then just feel the blood trickle down to your head. It just feels so good and relaxing. You can do a quick yoga session. I feel like when you're feeling so anxious and you're in the moment of feeling anxiety, 
you can just feel like you're closing in on yourself something that just gets your body moving and that my friends amigos amigas familia that is the story of my anxiety and everything that i have learned at least the most useful things that i have learned about anxiety and how to not get rid of anxiety but how to manage it i hope this conversation just inspires you to be honest with your friends to be honest with your family whoever you're comfortable talking to if you're not in a great headspace right now i encourage you please talk about it it feels just even just saying it out loud i'm not okay just makes you feel so much better we are going to get through 2023 as long as we care about our mental health and that of others i love you so much and i will see you in the next video bye